Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, we've got Kalkin Montero speaking to us about project-based learning and the maker movement in the classroom. Kalkin obtained her PhD in computer science at the School of Com Information Science and Technology from Hokkaido University in Japan. And she works at the intersection of human-computer interaction, effective computing, and ICT for development within educational contexts. She's got ample experience working in multicultural environments on the deployment of innovative solutions to societal challenges, with a particular focus on the application of educational technologies. She's a senior researcher and H2020 eCraft to Learn project lead, investigator and coordinator at the School of Computing, University of Eastern Finland. So she is joining us from very far today, and we look forward to your um, presentation today, Kalkin. Over to you. Um, thank you, Nicola, for the introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Kalkin Suero Montero speaking to you from the cold north of um, the Finnish winter. Um, I'm very happy to be here today, and I was invited by, by Nicola um, to discuss a little bit with you um, what we do in our projects of eCraft to Learn on digital fabrication and make it movement in education. And specifically, I'll be talking about project-based learning and the make a movement in the classroom. How are we um, getting there? Um, the talk, hopefully, uh, won't be too long, and we will have enough time for, for discussion. Um, so, as, as you heard before, just whenever you have a question, feel free to, to place it in and perhaps we can have a small discussion um, as we move along through the, through the presentation. Okay, um, so briefly, let's, let's just start. And I'm going to start by introducing what STEAM is, because it's had a lot to do with what we are doing here, with what uh, project-based learning is. Um, and so on and so forth. So I'm going just to start by introducing STEAM and um, why it is important. So um, basic definition of STEAM, starting from the acronym, it stands from science, um, technology, engineering, art, and math. So that is the acronym of STEAM. And um, it is a, a type of education that is focused on interdisciplinary projects. So we try to mix and match several different um, subjects and uh, try to make a holistic view when we solve some problems. And in a way, it is an interesting um, pedagogical methodology um, for, for assisting the student to learn better, to see um, what they cognitively learn, apply it um, to real life. So that is the, the beauty of STEAM. We have the mixture of um, strong and hard sciences with arts, with soft sciences, with social sciences. We see everything integrated. And um, that is what is going to bring benefits in the educational arena. So we have that with this science, technology, engineering, arts, and math education, um, the combination of knowledge from curricular subjects, the traditional subjects that we have, um, with 21st century skills and aptitudes and competences. So for um, within STEAM education, we have um, not only the cognitive area is important, but also um, those uh, cross-cutting skills are developed and are very important as well. Such as skills include, for example, teamwork or digital literacy, decision making, problem solving, and um, it's, it's a beautiful combination in that way. So we have science that meets art and that meets math, and you create something nice out of it so that the kids that are learning through this methodology actually grasp what they are doing, grasp, have a better concept of the application of the knowledge, of the cognitive knowledge that they are gaining at school. So that is the STEM education in a very much nutshell. Um, now, how do we get, actually, how do we get to 
um, to the point of saying, yes, this is actually STEAM, and this is the way that we are going to de deploy STEAM in a classroom. Well, um, there are um, the idea of STEAM, the nature of STEAM education, relies on the interdisciplinary of the interdisciplinarity of the projects, and is strongly related to group or to collaborative work. So when we say that we are going to develop those skills, those 21st century skills, we're talking about helping the students um, foster their abilities to work together, foster their ability to see um, a problem in a different way and try to solve it, but not alone. Because we know that society these days are not individualistic. It's, it's more collective. It's more um, a group work that is of value. So that uh, is how STEAM is actually implemented within um, school grounds. Through interdisciplinary projects, mixing science, technology, engineering, arts, math, all together, and having that part of technology actually as the basic link between all of the other subjects that you may have. So you can find a beautiful project of history with some technological representation and to some art display. So that is a, 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 might be a very interesting STEAM project right in there. Um, I think now I will have a very short video just to uh, ground this idea of STEAM. And I hope that Jacob can help me uh, play this video now. systems. Everything has changed. During the last decades, there have been a great evolution in education systems. Everything has changed in many aspects. Curriculums, physical environment, teachers, teaching methods, assessment, and students, all have changed. In traditional education, curriculums are not integrated. Students take many subjects that does not relate to each other. There is no link between subjects. And students ask, what is that for? There are no clear learning outcomes for subjects. Students are bored. Receptors. Work individually. And lack 21st century skills needed. Teachers are transmitter of knowledge. Doers and don't link subjects together, making it one-way communication with students. Exams depend on memorization, more than understanding, and there is no linkage with real life. Classrooms are boring. They are based on giving information with no feedback, no participation or teamwork between students. But now, in the 21st century, we are living in a fast-growing world. Knowledge are acquired by just one click. The whole world is connected, and people have access to each other's easily. The traditional education does not fit with this anymore. The new and traditional education stress on enhancing 21st century skills as perseverance, problem solving, creativity, critical thinking, entrepreneurship skills, and teamwork. The new education system is STEAM. It is integrating science, technology, engineering, arts and mathematics in one project-based curriculum. The teacher acts as a mentor and a facilitator for students, and organizes information given to students in an easy understandable way. Assessment is project-based authentic step-by-step. Step. It is based on teamwork efforts and cooperation to create the project within the assigned time and given resources. Students are now engaged participating, eager to learn, and ready to be the next generation of entrepreneurs. The world is now shifting to adopt a STEAM education system which fits the 21st century requirements. For more information you can visit our websites or Facebook page. You can also reach us through our email or mobile number. We would be happy to receive any inquiries.
Yes, so now we go back to the to the slides. Um, yes, as, as the video was very nicely presented right in there, um, the beauty of STEAM relies on the integration of all of these subjects, making them more um, applied, making them more um, interesting for the students to see that their cognitive knowledge actually finds an outlet within um, societal issues, perhaps, or even just application to some other uh, school subjects. So the subjects are not separated anymore. They are more integrated. And you can see better how um, what you learn in one subject can be actually applied to help or enhance the knowledge that you may have of another subject. So um, yes, it's a little, it has a little video, but it's quite informative. I, I thought that maybe that could ground the idea of what STEAM is and how it, it is different from um, traditional type of education. Also, an, uh, another idea that just came to my mind when I was uh, uh, just now watching the video is that, well, in fact, STEAM is, is uh, it's not that new a concept, but it started as a STEM before. So without the A, art was not included, it was just the sciences, the technology, the engineering and math. But now we recognize that art is an important is an important part for enhancing creativity, and so we have to bring art into the other subjects, the other more technological technical subjects. And so STEAM now is there is the more appropriate way to um, integrate all of the different um, cognitive knowledges that the students may have. All right, so that is uh, in a nutshell what STEAM STEAM is. Now let's see what type of educational tools are there available to actually develop a STEAM education. Um, first, a very good tool that we can use um, to, for STEAM, and because probably you already have seen it and maybe guess what it is, is uh, the, me the pedagogical methodology of project-based learning. And what is project-based learning? Well, exactly more or less what <laughs> Um, the, the, the name indicates, right? It is a, it's a way, it's a methodological process in which the students get their knowledge and uh, their skills, if they improve their skills, by um, working on real projects, on engaging, engaging, they engage in themselves um, on real life projects that they need to solve. And these they do, of course, collaboratively. So there are many steps um, for um, establishing project-based learning methodologies in the classroom. But generally speaking, um, I like to think of this process as a four, five-stage process, uh, process. And I'm going now to just very briefly start by telling you that uh, the first thing that you do, the first thing that you do in project-based learning is to explore. Um, after exploring, with that exploration result, then you planned how are you going to do something from what you have explored. And then, based on the plan, you create some particular solution, which then you will evaluate, and then you will repeat the cycle. Um, generally speaking, that exploration will take you to the understanding of what the problem is, and why that is actually a problem, and if there has been already own solutions that have been proposed. So that exploration will give you some sort of in-depth analysis of what is the particular problem that you have to solve. Say that if it is within a classroom, the teacher will tell you, okay, now we have photosynthesis, and you have got to understand how photosynthesis occurs, and perhaps learn, you just represent it using technology, perhaps, which is a, a real um, a project of ours. And so, the way uh, that the students need to approach this is actually understanding what is happening in photosynthesis. What, what can, how can that photosynthesis process be represented? And what are the important elements of that representation, for example? Once that exploration part is over, or at least uh, fulfilled to a certain degree, then you form a plan. Uh -huh. Now I know more or less what is the problem, I understand that some people have tried to solve it in this and that way, and now um, I need to find out how I'm going to solve it myself within this group of people. 
So you plan with your team, you see what you need to solve the problem, you see how you can do um, to get um, that plan realized. Once you have your plan, then you go to the stage of actually building the proposed solution. You said, all right, now this is my plan of what I already have explored. Let's try and build this thing according to the plan. Once that is built, you will evaluate whether what you have built is actually a feasible solution or can it be done better. And then you go and repeat this type of process. And um, an interesting, an interesting um, say, step in between this evaluation exploration is that the dissemination. You need to reflect on what you already have um, obtained and see how you can transmit that knowledge to others. Because by doing so, you yourself, through that reflection, gain more, more insights, gain more knowledge. And that is on, um, part, uh, another important part is also um, within all of this process, from the student's perspective, is the skill of auto-regulation. The, the students are the ones who understand that at what stage they are, what they need from within each one of the states. Do they need to explore more? Do they need a better plan within the group work that they are doing? Do we need any materials for the creation of the solution, etc.? And another important aspect within this methodology is that the students actually have certain control on their learning process. So they, the students actually decide how they work and what they build. For example, what materials they use to build their creations, if they, um, they need to do so, um, they decide uh, what, what um, sources of information they may be using. So they do have control on the learning process. What is the role of the teachers in all of this? As we uh, heard before from the video, uh, we, we noticed that the teacher, uh, the, the, this whole idea is not teacher-centered, it's student-centered. So the teacher facilitates the process. The teacher um, puts forward the scaffolding methodology. It, they are a coach, they are the mentor, they can provide some sort of assistance um, to help students go through um, their solutions in their minds, to realize the, their thoughts, to help them find, uh, say, telling them, OK, if you need more information, there are these places that you can actually perhaps try discovering uh, whether they are useful for you. So the teacher scaffolds the process in this way. And it is very important to notice that within this um, methodology, the student is the main character of their learning experience. So that is um, kind of what makes STEAM um, beautiful. Now, we don't have a methodology in which the teacher is the person in front of the classroom telling the students what they need to learn. We have a methodology in which the learners themselves understand they have a need to learn something in order to achieve certain solutions. And so they are motivated to achieve those solutions just because it's a real life problem that they are trying, that is engaging for them, and that they are trying to solve. So this is the in kind of a, a brief outline of the project-based learning, which is one of the main tools or the, one of the main pedagogical tools um, for um, implementing STEAM education. Now, there are other type of tools um, which are more like technological tools or um, ludic, um, say gaming tools um, that are also used um, for, with project-based learning. And those educational tools will depend, the, cho the, the choice of the tool will depend on the type of project that wants to be developed. For example, we have uh, tools, environments of education such as Lego, which um, we are uh, all familiar with. But the Lego now is not only um, for, for playing at, at home, it's actually a gaming environment for school as well. So the gaming environment has both sides, the physical and the digital. And you have educational robots, in, for example, to learn science, programming, engineering, and technology. So that is a good tool that is being used um, or project-based learning, particularly when you want to demonstrate how robots, say, uh, work. Imagine that the kids want to know how the rovers in Mars 
behave. They can make a little simulation here on Earth using um, this type of Lego robots, for instance. Um, another interesting educational tool, which now is more on the virtual side only, is uh, coming from the game, very popular game, probably you're all familiar with it, Minecraft. Minecraft is uh, an entire world um, uh, on its own, and it has now also an educational uh, component, an educational element on it. And this type of uh, digital environment actually creates amazing gaming opportunities, not only for entertainment, but also for enhancing 21st century skills, such as creativity, collaboration, and problem solving. You have to work in group to solve some of the puzzles, or to make some um, cities, or to make some plants grow within the space that you're given, um, in, within the, this Minecraft room. And uh, it is a good community, it's a big community, and uh, it's the open community as well. And they have created different type of lessons. There are many lessons in there according to the age of the students, according to the subject that want to be created. I mean, there is a lesson about, um, for example, language learning. So the student is not only through Ronald Dahl books, Students not only learning literature, they're learning language, uh, developing the language skills, but they are also learning how to use technology to do all of these things. Um, they are doing all this in the virtual world. So there are many different types of uh, lessons in there that can be used um, uh, to create this type of project, project lessons. Um, in our particular work, we have also developed our own tool um, it is called eCraft Learn, uh, inspired by the maker movement and the do-it-yourself philosophy. And this is now what I'm going to introduce to you very briefly. What is this all about and how we see um, project-based learning deployed through this particular digital environment. So let's talk a little bit about this eCraft to Learn project, which is the one that um, um, we, we are working on together with another um, 11 partners throughout Europe. Um, it is on digital publication and facilitating the inclusion of digital publication and maker movement to educational context, both informal and formal context. Um, so the idea is to research, design, pilot, and validate a learning ecosystem that allows the users, in this case students and teachers, um, to um, create computer-supported artifacts from scratch, so basically making something from scratch within the classroom. Um, there is uh, the newsletter of uh, the project in there, if you're interested, uh, you're very welcome to join the community and, and learn more or less what we are up to at every moment of the development of this project. Um, so let me tell you what digital fabrication is and how we see it. Um, we see the term as activities involving the creation of artifacts, but notice that it's not only in the virtual world, but actually physical world. So you can use both physical and digital components to create um, something within the digital fabrication arena. Now, the, this takes me to the maker movement. And what is the maker movement? Because we're trying to involve the, these two concepts and bring them to the educational context. Now, the maker movement is a, is a trend, and you could maybe define it as um, uh, the do-it-yourself philosophy with um, technological orientation, perhaps. So it's, it's basically that. You do yourself with technology, basically. And you use recycled, uh, recycled materials. You use raw materials. You just don't, don't leave anything to waste. You recycle everything you can and give it more value or create it more value you can create more value with um, reusing it and giving it a different purpose, perhaps. So um, that is the basic idea of the make it movement in there. Now you have the basic idea of the digital fabrication. Now these two concepts together is what we're trying to put forward within our eCraft to Learn project. Now, um, what is what we are envisioning with this? 
Well, our um, learning ecosystem should be uh, established in a way that facilitates ideation from the students that participate in it, that facilitates creativity and problem solving using recycled materials to build their creations, or 3D printers to actually design and print something new that they can find elsewhere. They com there is a space within this ecosystem that combines art and computational thinking. So we have some tasks such as theater robotics through presentation of a theater called play using robots. We have uh, the space for the making of those computer supporting artifacts, including design, including the programming of it. So we, we are trying to build this um, ecosystem such that we um, foster the skills of the students and the, in a way that they mystify technology. Technology is not anymore a black box, but it's actually a white box. So that is what we are trying to put forward, that uh, idea of white box paradigms, that the, the new paradigm within education, the users are not only, only users but are also creators of that technology. And the benefits you can imagine um, are many, right? We have we are creating 21st century, 21st century um, citizens that are empowered, that have digital literacy, and that are actually confident to become the entrepreneurs of our world in 2025. So that is um, what we are putting forward with our with our uh, project. We have, of course, uh, of course, created a pedagogical core that is very strongly linked to the methodologies and the technologies that we're trying to bring to the classroom. We understand that the use of technology cannot only be used um, as such. You have, it has to go, go together, hand in hand, with a strong pedagogical approach for it to happen. So, um, perhaps you can see in here the different stages of our pedagogy that we're putting forward relate quite well with uh, the project-based learning approaches and also with the design uh, processes, the design thinking and processes. So we have the stages of ideation, of planning, creation, programming, making those artifacts that are created a bit more interactive, and then later with the sharing. And with this sharing, we're trying to um, make the students reflect on what they have done as a group and what they have achieved and how, and then to let others know what happened during that process. There are elements um, of digital fabrication um, that I'm going to very briefly touch some of them. And at least um, in my view, I can see that digital fabrication can be com the combination of those digital tools and physical tools, but mainly the imagination of the person. Because that imagination, that creativity is what's going to foster the way, interesting ways in which all of these tools are going to mix and match and are going to come together um, to be applied to, for, for example, a history class or a biology class or a chemistry class. So that is the idea with um, these elements. One of those very much, um, very well used, actually, um, tools uh, for digital fabrication is the Arduino board. And that board, which is very small, is open source and is an entire platform. The platform includes this physical board as well as a programming environment. And you can make amazing things with this board. This is part of the programming environment that is block-based, very easy to approach the kids. actually love it. Um, and with that, you can actually make whatever artifact you have alive. You can make it interactive. You can make it uh, responsive. You can add sensors to this board and make a flower open when it light touches it or close when it's dark in the room. So um, that type of idea is what we're trying to put forward. Um, using these tools that are out there, putting it together through a pedagogical um, to pedagogical processes to create something interesting from the perspective of the students. And of course, Arduino uh, has a very strong community uh, on education in the educational arena. Um, we also have Arduino as one of our partners in the project that we, um, that we are having, uh, the eGraph to Learn project. 
Another digital fabrication tool is um, the Raspberry Pi. And this is another tool that really has made, um, has demystified technology quite a lot and has made uh, um, much accessible um, the teaching of technological concepts in schools. Why? Because the Raspberry Pi is basically a, a PC, it's a computer, but that of the size of a, of a credit card. You can use with the proper, you can plug to in uh, your monitor, your keyboard, your mouse, you can plug to it um, even a camera for taking pictures and you have exactly the functionalities of a PC on that small size um, credit card size uh, uh, device. And uh, uh, about this Raspberry Pi, I would like to show you a very brief video, it's, it's also very, very small. Um, perhaps um, Jacob can help me with this. So you've got your first Raspberry Pi, you lucky thing. But now what? Well, fear not, adventurers. I'm here to explain all. The Raspberry Pi is a tiny computer that has the ability to do loads of wonderful things. So, let's take a closer look. <laughs> you probably want to use a mouse or a keyboard. That's what these USB ports are for. Oh, wait! There's also an HDMI port for a display. You can use a monitor or even your family TV. <laughs> and this is an Ethernet port, so you can connect to the Internet. <laughs> your Raspberry Pi even has a connector for a special camera module. It can hook up to lots of other devices if you use a USB hub too. So now we've had a look around the Raspberry Pi, let's get set up. First, you're going to need a screen. This can be connected with an HDMI or analog cable, depending on the kind of display you're using. Next, a USB mouse and keyboard. A micro USB power supply, like one you'd use to charge your mobile phone. And an Ethernet cable to get online. The operating system runs from a micro SD card, just like the one in your digital camera. You can download your operating system for free from the Raspberry Pi website. If you want to get started even quicker, you can buy a noobs card which comes preloaded with a choice of operating system for everyone, from beginners to experts. And there you have it. Your shiny new Raspberry Pi is ready for you to boot up and start doing fantastic things. Build an arcade machine. Make a robot. Create music. Fly a drone. Or send your Pi into space. So what are you waiting for? Go on, make your Raspberry Pi do something truly Amazing! <laughs> oh. <laughs>
the project that started in the United Kingdom back in 2006, although it was only launched in 2012, and it has gained quite a lot of traction, particularly in the educational arena. Um, so um, now we have some, seen some of those tools that are used um, for digital publication, those digital tools. The physical tools, as you can imagine, are all sorts of tools that are lying around, um, normal craft uh, tools, um, tape, cardboard, um, recycled materials such as PET bottles. I mean, whatever you have lying around, it can be used to assist in developing one of these uh, projects for STEAM education through project-based learning. And in our case, what we are doing with the, uh, to reinforce these activities is uh, creating basically a digital environment that supports each one of the stages of the pedagogical core that we're putting forward. So within our digital platform, we have um, tools that support ideation, that is digital tools, digital tools that support planning, digital digital tools that support creation, programming, and sharing of what is created on, in the, with the online community. Besides having, um, having these uh, in, the, in the digital environment, we also have a physical environment for our project, which is based on both the Raspberry Pi computer and the Arduino board. And this is um, a choice. Uh, do you, well, it, it is a say, cost-effective choice if uh, the schools where this uh, e-craft to learn ecosystem is going to be deployed doesn't have um, computers to do this type of um, deployment. They don't have to invest a huge amount of money to be able to reap the benefits of the project. Now, with very little amount of money, you can get your Raspberry Pis, get your Arduinos, and um, connect. Uh, your monitors, keyboards, mouse, and there you are, you have a good computer, and you're ready to start uh, the making process. Now, some of the, um, some of the ideas and projects that we have put forward within our project, um, and this one is a very introductory one, um, was the Lighthouse project. And what did we do? We said, okay, um, using paper or plastic bottles, you need to construct a lighthouse in miniature and have it have the light of it to blink a specific rate and only at night, or in other words, when the room was dark or the light was low. So we said, okay, these are the things you need, and now how can we make it happen? And we have uh, tried this particular exercise in different workshops, and it is always amazing the type of things that um, we, we get as a result. Notice that for this to happen, um, the group's form needs to go through the, okay, now we have the problem, is creating a lighthouse, now um, how do we solve it? They need to imagine a solution, they need to plan a solution, then they need to implement that solution in the part of create, they need to make that solution interactive, in this case making the light blink, and in the end they need to share um, what the results of that solutions are. So we have uh, that pedagogical process in which uh, the technology implementation is integrated. And uh, some of the um, results that we have had, um, and here I have some, some pictures, and there was a small, actually small video here, but that is not going to play, I don't think, from this particular, um, uh, no, from this particular slide. But the idea is that um, these uh, this little um, lighthouse, in this case, uh, uh, double plastic and paper cup uh, lighthouse, um, you could see it actually blink at certain rate. And you could see that blinking when um, there, was a, there was a cover, there was a shadow in the sensors that were put in there, and etc. So this type of uh, very simple project, uh, something that uh, um, people can grasp perhaps uh, all the basic concepts and try to see, okay, what do I need to make an LED turn on, an LED blink at a certain rate, and how do I get all these? I mean, all of this knowledge is what is in, uh, intrinsically 
expected to be the outcome in the end when the light on the lighthouse is turning on or off or if it doesn't work at least they understand why it doesn't work and what can they do to actually make it better. Um, other projects that we have actually implemented well, is, is the concept of theater robotics of having robots uh, play uh, a Shakespeare piece and uh, uh, the photosynthesis uh, project in which is not showing in there um, their, uh, what their photosynthesis components are, but according to the diagram, you need light, you need carbon dioxide, you need water, and the plant will uh, exert oxygen. But uh, those essential uh, the fundamentals of photosynthesis, like carbon dioxide and water, how can you represent that using um, the different technologies that you have, using digital technologies and using um, uh, physical tools, physical recycled materials. So these, um, we have had quite interesting outcomes from the implementation of these ideas. So um, just to try to wrap up what we have been discussing um, um, up to now, and probably we can open the floor for some discussion, um, give you some, some takeaway tips for fostering making. Um, a, a good idea to concretize knowledge is to do it with hands-on project, engage the students on solving something that is real. So um, students should be encouraged to investigate, to explore, to put forward their own solutions to hands-on projects. And it is again very important that those projects have some real world taste to them because then they can see the application of the knowledge they're gaining um, to something that it is useful. It's a easier for them to link um, and see the, the utility of what they are learning at school to what is happening in the real life outside the schools, for example. Also, um, it is important to foster that cross-disciplinary, interdisciplinary thinking. Um, it is not only math in these days, it's math and art, and how math actually is represented through art, or how art is represented through math. So it is a combination of things, just history is not history alone. We have history together with biology, and there is some link in there that we can find using um, mathematical equations. So everything is interrelated, and we need to foster in the students that ability to think interdisciplinarily. Encouraging curiosity is also something very important when we are deploying any type of STEAM education project. Um, it's good for the students to wonder, it's good for the students to question, although sometimes it uh, might not be uh, within the comfort zone of the teacher, but it's something that teachers need to learn as well to manage. And also it is very important and probably of most to make the learning student-centered um, because that's, that's how the trend is. Now we have personalized learning path, now we have the students having more control into um, the learning process. And, and that is um, a good way forward. Okay, I think I have uh, finished. Uh, that's all the slides I have uh, for the moment. Um, just, uh, um, I received one question about assessment. How, how do we assess um, with um, this type of, um, how do we assess the learning, the learning of the student? And of course, it's differently from the traditional way of teaching. Um, it's not only the assessment of the cognitive skills um, that it is important within STEAM education um, these days. It is the assessment of, uh, it's, it's more a holistic perspective of, of assessment. So um, with the project that the students are developing, developing um, a way of assessing whether uh, they are learning or not is to see actually how they are how the project fulfilled those objectives that you have set up before beforehand. Um, are the students actually able to identify and solve real problems? Are they actually able to apply their cognitive concepts to real life situations? Are they actually building prototypes? Are they building solutions? If that is the case, then you know your students are learning. Um, 
how are you measuring the understanding or the things that they might need more emphasis on or that you might request them to look more deeply into. Well, you can gauge the student's knowledge or, or um, progress through entry or exit questions before or after a given session or a given lesson, perhaps. Um, discuss, see with them how, how are they progressing in that way. Um, you have got to remember that teamwork is uh, very important. This is not only one person's work, but actually a group of students and how they behave within that group of students how their skills are managing other people's way of view and putting forward the, the way of view and negotiating a solution that actually satisfies the goal of the project and that satisfies the, um, the kind of the sharing of knowledge of all of the group members is very important. So see how your students are developing that skill um, and observe also their attitudes and confidence because those are things that now are, are very important besides their cognitive knowledge. Um, these are just some notes on assessment. Of course, there is more um, uh, information I have, have put in most of the slides um, for the readings, basically, um, different uh, uh, sources that I have used uh, to collect some thoughts. And now, um, of course, you're very welcome to continue your own um, learning path on, this, on these issues. Um, thank you for, for listening. And now it is time, I suppose, for question and answering. Thanks so much, Kalkin. Uh, yes, so Tony had a question here. Uh, he asks, given the relationship between STEAM and the maker movement, how do teachers navigate the tension between powerful learning through making and the siloed curriculum of most education systems? Yes, um, that is a, a very good question and a very interesting question and something that we are actually experiencing in our own project here. I mean, the maker movement tries to open up the minds of the students, but of course within a, a formal education you have very much established curriculum. And so how do you open the student's mind when you have to teach them that plus 2 plus 2 is 4? Um, and it's very rigid like that, and there is no more space for anything. Well, what we did and what we are actually doing in, in our piloting, um, because we face the same conundrum, um, was to um, kind of integrate the, uh, the ideas that we are putting forward with the project. Say, um, the project-based learning, having them developing projects and etc., uh, based on uh, curricular lessons. So if the teacher had a lesson, say, on chemistry, and actually they had, the, we are, were implementing in two different lessons. We were implementing a, a biology lesson, which was mixed with mathematics, so biology and mathematics together, and a security and arts lesson. So. Um, we try to find the lessons from the curriculum and uh, um, implement these ideas of developing that particular lesson through these five stage pedagogies with the student and um, bringing in the technological components through the different um, through the different stages of that pedagogy. So that is how, uh, in our case, we were able to kind of kind of make a compromise. The students are not completely free to come up with solutions to any any given problem out there, but they are giving a problem from the curricular from the curricular activities, say a problem in with the representation perhaps of um, 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 photosynthesis and how photosynthesis occur, and uh, we have beautiful um, creations in the end. Students had to learn what are the main components of photosynthesis and how they could actually represent these using LEDs, using controlling the LEDs, say they had three different aspects that they needed to represent, of um, carbon dioxide, light, and water. So they have different sensors to measure whether there was enough light to give an alarm, the plant is needing light, whether there was enough water, even an arm, the plant is needing water, etc. So we tried to find curricular subject, the subjects from the curriculum and integrate the idea of making a project out of the lesson so that the lesson is more dynamic 
instead of having it just the teacher teaching that these three components are important, actually making the kids see why they are important and using technology for making that representation happen. So I think at least so far that has worked for us and what we hope that we can actually um, make it uh, to the wider community as well, that that is one way forward that can actually be achieved. Thank you, Kalkin. Um, Olufemi also has a question. He wanted to know about the learning curve. He says, Arduino is interesting, but how is the learning curve? I'm just thinking of this in light of constrained students face with the use of technology. And his second question was around the cost uh, and availability of materials um, for digital fabrication. Um, regarding the learning curve, uh, the learning curve, I can imagine that at the beginning. Well, uh, let me tell you, we have had our own um, our own pilots that have lasted, say, from the students that had no idea of how to use the technologies that we're putting forward to them completing a project. Um, I think uh, we have had it in eight lessons. Um, and that, um, I mean, it is, it is maybe demanding for some kids, but the kids don't need to be um, experts in technology to be able to run through it, to be able to actually go forward within a STEAM project. They need to know enough and get interested enough, in, motivated enough to carry it out. So for some kids it might be faster, for some kids it might be a bit slower. Um, that is also something that is very important to keep in mind is the teamwork. Um, it's not like one kid had to learn everything, but they can actually separate their um, group work and their tasks among their members. And that facilitates um, um, the moving forward through the processes. So um, I would say that yes, it may take some time at the beginning especially, when uh, neither the kids or the teachers are ready or prepared for doing these, and this is something new, but it is doable, and um, I believe that after the first iteration, things are much faster. Within our environment, we are trying to put forward open educational resources so that uh, starting from how do we carry out one e to learn project, what stages are there, what are the steps that we need to go through, what can we learn? We have within our user interface, we have also information on the different sensors that the students have access to, so that they can also video links through the Arduino pages, Arduino community, so that they, um, when they need it, the knowledge is there or the information is there. So it's, it's like information on demand, um, on, depending on what they need at each one of these stages of the pedagogical process. So um, it may take for some kids longer, for some kids uh, faster, a, a shorter time, but um, it is definitely doable. Again, again, I have to emphasize that it, this is not the work of only one person, it's, it's a teamwork. And as such, it's important for the kids to um, learn to distribute the roles and, and to see how can all of them contribute to make the project happen. Because that is also a very important skill. Um, now, regarding the availability of the um, tools for digital fabrication, um, one Arduino board, um, it depends which type of board, but one Arduino board might be about 20, 20 euros, I think. And one Raspberry Pi, almost the cost of a Raspberry Pi again. I cannot give you a precise cost because I don't. I don't have it in my mind, but it's not an expensive, a super expensive device. And um, I believe that for schools, like for this, um, if you want to actually deploy this as a school, um, these companies, of course, are offer much discounted prices. As a hobbyist, you know, these are the normal prices, perhaps 20, 25 euros for one Arduino board, and maybe something similar amount of money for the Raspberry Pi, perhaps a little bit more, um, but as a school, then it is more accessible even. Um, 
Another thing that I'd like to emphasize is that, in, at least from our projects, the digital environment is uh, web, web browser-based. So if you have your own computer or if the schools have their own computers, they can access um, those digital tools through um, the computers that they already have, as well as the mobile devices. So we're trying to make it so to minimize the costs for um, the people that want to use these, these um, tools, these digital tools. Um, and it's just going to be the cost to maybe getting some of the physical tools for making. But also a good thing that it helps in there is that you can use recycled materials. So you don't have to buy everything. You can reuse whatever you have in there. Um, and it just, you know, it might depend on the person how much time and effort they want to put into tinkering with things. But it's, it's very much a rewarding activity. So yes, I, I would totally recommend to, to give it a try and to see how you can start imagining, if you're a teacher, how can you actually implement any of your lessons using these thoughts, having these pedagogical processes, from ideation, planning, to creation, to programming, to um, sharing what uh, this, the, the group of students do. Um, it's, a, it's an interest. You will be surprised with um, how resourceful the students can be at, at getting information. And, and then when they are motivated, they, they do wonders. We have seen this in our, in our project pilots, really. Oh, thank you. I am aware that we are over time. It's now six minutes past two. But we've got some questions still. Um, would you like to take questions, uh, Kalkin, or should we continue discussion on the Facebook group? Um, um, I, I'd be okay to take at least another two questions. I mean, we started anyways about 10 minute, minutes past one, so let's make it one hour. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, we had a question here. Rolitza asks, um, at, one po at what point does the designing begin? So my sense is she means um, when do people start making something? Um, for the, the, the students or, or children, when do they start? Like, do they do a training first? And then Joy had a question here around schools employ, some schools employ a curriculum integration specialist in the US and South Africa. Is there such a person in Finland? Um, okay, so the first question was, when does the actual making begin, right? Um, so, um, yes, of course the students need some basic knowledge. For example, in our, in our case, we have an introduction session in which we let the students know what is happening, what type of, um, um, what type of project they will be, uh, realizing and um, what type of technologies they will be getting acquainted with and um, the whole kind of idea of the pedagogical stages and um, we give them information on the different sensors that they might be using. We give them information on what is the Raspberry Pi, they, if yet they are going to actually use it in their school. Otherwise, um, perhaps they don't need it, so that information can be um, uh, omitted. We give them information on their Arduino board and why uh, it is useful and in which way it is useful. And so um, that information surely has, has to be provided um, before any, any type of tinkering happens. I mean, if the students have no clue of absolutely nothing, then we will take more time. Probably they will get there, but it will be slowly and much slower. And as we know, um, in formal education, time is, uh, is a precious resource. So uh, we have some info sessions. Of course, before doing these, um, the teachers that are participating in our pilots, they were trained uh, on the different technologies. They were trained on the pedagogical aspects, just for them not to be a choke, not to be choked 
um, that the role is not the central um, place of the classroom, but is more like a coach, a mentor, that of holding the learning process. So they were trained on these concepts. They were the concepts were made clear to them. Um, they were trained on the different technological approaches and the different technological tools, sorry, as well as um, um, the virtual, the digital environment of the project, etc. So they, they had the knowledge um, beforehand. And so they are more confident of what is happening in their classroom with their students. And then they take care of um, going with the students through the entire process of the five stages of the pedagogical uh, core that I just show you to develop a project in the end. So um, there is information that needs to be given beforehand, just like anything else. Um, it can be even, uh, you can have it as a flipped classroom uh, um, exercise. Students also can find information on their own if you let them uh, can investigate. You can give them some materials for them to read at home and then just discuss these once they are in the classroom and so on and so forth. So there are ma many ways of um, introducing these concepts to the students and just hit the road as they are learning. So whenever they need more information, then they will go and find that information that they need at the moment to continue. So that is something that we have um, kind of uh, observed from our pilot, that the information is obtained on demand. Yes, sometimes when everything is very new, if you give all the information and they are not really working, they get discouraged. Uh, they get bored because they are doing just exactly the same as always. But no, you just let them, you know, start work. What is it that you need now at this moment? Oh, I don't know what type of sensor that might be here. Okay, what do you want to put forward? Oh, I would like to see whether at night this actually turns on or off. Okay, so we explain what type of sensor there is. We can just give them the list of sensors. They can see what is available and they can see what they can actually use to realize their idea. So that's how we have done it. But as I said, we have open we have open educational resources within our unified user interface, which is that digital environment that I just showed you. Um, let me see if I can present it here. So we have open educational resources within that digital environment. Um, this one in here um, that the students can actually access and um, will find information if they need to. Of course, this um, is a prototype version, but it's, it's um, very much available um, for for anyone that needs it and needs to see it. It's, it's a web-based browser, and you can find uh, how to, you can actually access it and have access to the different um, um, tools that we are offering. They might not be native tools of the interface. They are third-party tools that we can use. Um, uh, to, well, support each one of these stages. Um, regarding the other question, um, sorry, what was the other question again, Nicola? It was around, um, well, in South Africa and the U.S., there's often someone who works with oh, right. schools. Right, it's uh, integration. Employed yes. as a uh, Is there such a person in Finland? Was the question. Mm. Yeah. I, I am not aware. Um, if there is a specific individual working on curricular integration. Um, however, I know that curricular changes within Finland are, um, are a matter of, um, of the National Board of Education. So um, I don't know if it's only one particular individual that works in the different schools. I, I haven't never heard of such um, uh, an individual working in any individual in any particular school, but um, um, yes, it, it may be that um, the curricular integration, um, for example, for using this type of technology, at, at least within Finland, is a bit more flexible. I mean, if this tool, if the teacher considers that this tool is good um, to help to help them. Um, um, teach the lesson, they are free to use it. They don't need uh, to ask for any further um, permission from um, the school board or anything like this. 
Um, in Finland, education, the teachers have a lot of uh, freedom um, in that sense for, for kind of developing on, on the best way that they consider the lessons to be transmitted to the students. So um, we have been actually uh, quite, quite lucky in that sense within Finland in the pilots because both the school administration and the teachers are very happy to give these techniques and these ideas a try within their school grounds. So um, we haven't had the need of any particular person to help us include these ideas into the curriculum. It has been more ad hoc. It has been more um, the teachers say, OK, um, perhaps we can try this with this particular lesson. So we help the teacher elaborate that particular lesson. That has been the process so far. Thank you, Kalkin. It was very, very inspiring. I, I'm sure folks are going to go and try out some of those um, those resources, and perhaps I know Olafemi is looking into the Arduino um, resources. And I shared the, your website with which has some interesting use cases as well. Yes, um, please. I just, we have plenty of use cases in the website. We have plenty of um, all the information that you might need regarding the project or the concepts that we have put forward. And uh, the newsletter, just go ahead, sign in, sign in for it. Um, and you will keep updated on everything that we do. I'm very happy that uh, you stood with me all this time. Thank you, Nicola, again for inviting me. Oh, thank you. It was a really fascinating presentation. And on the topic of newsletters, our Emerge Africa one um, as well for folks. And in there you'll find information about our facilitating online course. Today is the D-Day for applications. So please don't forget those of you who are applying. And then we also have an upcoming Festival of e-learning. I mentioned it in the chat with Olufemi. Um, so you'll find that on the Emerge Africa website, the latest post um, is about that. And there's a link to the festival website. I'm sharing that here. Yeah, and thanks again for joining us. Um, and thank you, Colkin, for presenting um, this inspirational presentation for us today. Um, My pleasure. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.